Hello and welcome back. Uh, this exercise is another on measures of variability. So we're looking at uh, how observations within a data set are spread out. So we, uh, we've already discussed in previous videos, we've looked at the mean as the being a measure of central location. And now when we look at measures of variability, we're looking at how are those observations spread out <coughs> around the mean. Are there many observations very closely packed around the mean, or are they very widely spread out? So we've got a few different measures uh, to, to consider when we're looking at variability and how those observations are spread. Uh, we're going to look at a few of them in this problem, uh, except I'm, I'm going to uh, split this problem into two videos. Uh, I'm going to uh, respond to parts A and B in this video, and then I'll start another video for part uh, C, D, and E. Uh, just because calculating the variance uh, can be a, a little bit time consuming and, and somewhat tedious. So we'll get through A and B uh, fairly quickly here, and then uh, we'll, we'll start up again a fresh video for C, D, and E. So the first part is uh, just computing the range. Now, as far as uh, measures of spread go. The range is really the the most simplistic. Uh, by that I mean it uses the least amount of information uh, and really provides relatively little information in return. Uh, not to say it's not you it's 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 not useful, um, but it's just sort of the simplest. When we're calculating the range, it's uh, you know, it says compute the range, but the computations are are very minimal. The, the formula for a range is simply the difference between the largest value and the smallest value in that data set. So we're only looking at two values, uh, two observations in that data set. So that's what I mean when I say it uses the least amount of information. So all we're doing is looking at this observation and this observation, the smallest and the largest, and taking the difference. So 11 minus 5.6, uh, this is going to be 5.4. So in this data set, we're looking at CO2 emissions uh, per person or per capita. Uh, and the range, so the difference between the smallest and the largest is 5.4. And this is measured in the same units of measurement as the data itself. So this would be 5.4 metric tons of CO2 uh, per person. So that's our range. That gives us the distance between the smallest and the largest value. It tells us really nothing about what's going on uh, in between. So here's, here's our answer for part A. Uh, part B, compute the interquartile range. So now this, again, it's a range, you know, it's got the same, the same words, it's a very similar measure, but now the interquartile range is basically giving us the range of the middle 50%. So we're going to ignore the smallest 25%, ignore the largest 25%, and just look at the, the range of the middle 50%. So as you may recall, calculating quartiles, it's essentially the same as a percentile, except a, a quartile is a 25th percentile. The second quartile is the 50th, which is the same as the median. And the, seven, uh, the third quartile is the 75th percentile. So when we were calculating uh, percentiles or quartiles, we used this index uh, formula, which was uh, the percentile of interest divided by 100 times the sample size. So when we're looking at uh, quartiles, P was either 25, 50, or 75. Now when we're considering the interquartile range, so the IQR, this is the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. So we need to find out what these two values are first. So let's start with the Q3, so the third quartile. So this would then correspond, the index value that corresponds to that would be the 75th percentile times our sample size here is 10. So 0 0.75 times 10, this is going to be equal to uh, 7.5. So when we're using this, this index formula, uh, if we have a non-integer response or non-integer solution, 
uh, we would round it up. So this would then round up to 8. So we're looking at the 8th observation, uh, which in this data set, that 8th observation is here, 8.3. So what that means is that 75% uh, of the values in that data set are less than or equal to uh, 8.3 which of course in this sense, in, in this uh, discussion on interquartile range, it means that 25% are greater than or equal to uh, 8.3. And so those are the observations that we're actually going to be ignoring uh, in, this, in this calculation of an IQR, the interquartile range. So there we have 8.3 is our Q3 value. Uh, let's look at Q1. So now we're going to go, oh, I don't want an equal sign there. So now our index, we're looking at now the 25th percentile times 10. And so that's going to be equal to 2.5. So we round that up to 3. And so here's our first quartile which means that 25% of the observations are less than or equal to 5.9. So our interquartile range is that difference between 8.3 and 5.9. So we're looking at this range here. So we're sort of excluding that smallest 25%. We're excluding that largest 25%. And our interquartile range then, if I substitute these numbers in here, is 8.3 minus 5.9. And where's my calculator here? 8.3 minus 5.9. So my interquartile range is then 2.1. So there's my solution here. So the range of the middle 50% uh, covers a spread of 2.1 metric tons uh, per person. So there you have it. We have uh, our range for that whole data set ranging from 5.6 to 11. So that whole distance there is, uh, what did we have, 5.4. And then we isolated just the middle 50%, so here and here and that covers a range, the interquartile range of 2.1. So now we have a little bit more information as to how the observations are spread uh, within that data set. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it for parts A and B. Uh, as I said, I'm going to now start, uh, start a new video uh, and we'll pick up right here uh, and uh, go through parts C, D, and E. Okay, thanks for watching.